and the Earth we can date from from not only radioactive materials and 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 geological formations, but in fact we can determine the age of the Sun, which is formed around the same time by by building stars on a computer, which we can do, and running them, and just finding out exactly how long it takes for them to look exactly like the sun, and we find out it's 4.55 billion years. And so just one estimate, but all the estimates come in at exactly the same number. It's um, uh, four and a half billion years is the age of the solar system. And the universe we now know is 13.72 billion years old, where all the decimal places are, are, are significant, and that's amazing that we can determine the age of the universe to that accuracy. And, and again, it's not just from one technique, it's from many, many different techniques, and they all agree. There's no doubt about it. Some people get the sense that the Big Bang is controversial, or that the age of the universe is controversial. It's not, and they're not. It really happened. We know it, and, and all the data is consistent. We know, in some sense, more about the universe than we know about ourselves. Which is incredible when you think about it. It, it is, it is. I was just curious what current developments in your field that you're really excited about now. <laughs> um, well, the discovery of dark energy is the most exciting thing in my field and more also maybe the most important thing and the most important mystery in physics, if not all of science, the fact that the energy of the universe is the dominant energy of the universe is, resides in empty space and we have no idea why it's there and it will determine the future of the universe. And so it's kind of an amazing mystery and um, extremely exciting. I know for a lot of us, we don't understand kind of dark matter, I guess, dark energy. Could you help us understand that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, the, the, uh, the, the theory that describes the evolution of the universe is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which tells you that space responds to the presence of, of matter and energy by expanding or contracting or curving. And the amazing thing is if you put energy in empty space, that means if you get rid of all the particles and the radiation and everything else, you have nothing but empty space, and yet that empty space weighs something. It's gravitationally repulsive. It's not like the rest of everything else in the universe, which is attractive. And um, what we've discovered is that the expansion of the universe is speeding up. And, and the universe is expanding faster and faster because there's this repulsive energy dominating the universe. And so there's three times as much energy in nothing as there is in all of the energy associated with all the galaxies and stars that we see. And even that isn't everything because the galaxies and stars, the visible matter in galaxies and stars, is only about 5% of all the matter in galaxies. But about 95% of the matter in galaxies is, is stuff we can't see, which we call dark matter. And we think it's some new type of elementary particle. So you add up all the matter and dark matter, it adds up to 30% of the energy of the universe. But 70% resides in the empty space between galaxies. And, and we think it's there from due to quantum mechanics, but we don't understand it. We don't know how to calculate it. And it is, um, is indeed the biggest mystery in science. I wanted to ask you about the book you wrote, Quantum Man, which is about Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. and which just comes out this, this month. Back. Oh, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we'll make sure to put a link to that on our site. Because great. I know when I was in college, I took a, a science class, and we actually had to read one of Richard Feynman's book. And I can't can't remember the exact one, but I'll never forget a story where he talked about how a microwave works. And at the time, I didn't know how it worked. I'd gone my whole life using them and didn't understand it. And it was oh, that's great. Yeah, it was one of the first times I was really like, wow, that's a cool explanation to something in science. So I, I wanted to know why you chose to write about Feynman and what was your favorite aspect of his work? Well, I, I chose to write about him because, um, um, well, I was asked to actually. There was a series called Great Discoveries of, of biographies of well-known scientists throughout the, throughout the years. And um, I was thrilled to be able to ask to be do it because he, like, for me, like most other scientists, Feynman is kind of an idol. We, we, we look up to him. He was certainly the most significant physicist in the perhaps the second half of the 20th century, and an incredible teacher and charismatic individual as well. So when I was asked, I thought, great, I can read all his papers, which is, you know, most people don't realize that we tend to not read the original papers of scientists, because that's just not the way science works. It's, you know, it, 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 it gets refined and resolved, and the original papers are often not as easy to read. And so I thought this would be a chance for me to, to, um, to read all his papers, which would be fun. What was fun for me was learning about some of the things he did that I never knew about, this discussion of superfluidity and liquid helium. But the real heart, heart of the book, and the reason it's called Quantum Man, 
is that Richard Feynman changed the way we think about quantum mechanics, the way we understand quantum mechanics, so, so that it, it, he's changed the way we really think about the universe. And I wanted to be able to convey that to people because it's so remarkable and, it's, uh, and, and it, it really captures the weird and wacky aspects of the quantum universe that, that really nothing else does. And he's really admirable. And, and the way he discovered things, I mean, what I tried to do is to explain his science as seen through the arc of his life. There's a lot of books of the biographies of him, but, uh, you know, sort of anecdotal biographies. But nothing explaining his science, which, of course, is central to, you know, his being. And so, as someone said, as a Nobel Prize winning physicist has said on the inside cover, he said, this is, the fine, this is a biography Feynman would have liked. You mentioned earlier how all living things, I think it was all living things, are comprised of matter from stars? Everything on Earth, everything we can see on Earth, not just living things, but not living things. Okay. Every atom that makes up the Earth, essentially, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the iron, all the important stuff, that was only made in the center of stars that exploded. Wow. I, that's just, I can't even grasp that. I was hoping we we're, all, we're all stardust. It's, it's really amazing. At the beginning of time, the only elements that existed were hydrogen, or near the beginning of time, were hydrogen, helium, and lithium. The rest of it, the only place it could be created was in the fiery furnaces, nuclear furnaces of stars that burned and died over the years so that we could be born. And over the eight course of the Milky Way's history, about 200 million die, stars have died so that we could be born as I like to say. So as I said in something, forget Jesus, stars died, so you'd be born. But uh, it is truly one of the most poetic things I know about the universe. And the atoms in your left hand could be, come from a different star than your right hand, which is really, you know, which is great. How do you think we need to use science and logic in the way that people like you have to go about proving things as a guide to our thinking and our morals and basically how we should act as humans? Well, I think without science, we can't be moral in a sense because to, to, be, to act morally, we have to understand the consequences of our actions, and the only way to really understand them is with science, is an empirical understanding of the universe around us, to know how the world works, to be able to predict what will happen if we do some action. And so, in some sense, the, the process of empiricism, which is really the heart of science, is really, is really the heart of morality, too, because we really can't even know what's right and wrong without knowing how the universe really works. You know, if you lock someone in a room and just uh, we would never knew anything about the universe, it would be very difficult to have a, a consistent moral framework. And I think that uh, science, science and rationality together combine to help us in you know vast majority of cases define what's right and wrong. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Forgive me for this next question. I feel like you probably know the most about the universe out of anyone I'll ever speak to. So I kind of have to ask, what do you think about the possibility of aliens? Well, I think I think it's uh, I'd be very surprised if the universe wasn't full of them. Uh, you know, there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy and 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and that's a lot of stars. And most of the stars have planets around them. We're discovering, so it's a lot of solar systems. And I have a heart. And since life on Earth began about as soon as it could have, given the laws of physics, within a few hundred million years of the Earth's formation, it's hard for me to imagine that that process hasn't occurred elsewhere, or is occurring elsewhere. At the same time, it's a big universe. Therefore, it, even if life exists elsewhere in the universe, it's not obvious to me that we'll ever know about it, unfortunately. Last question I had for you. You speak at a lot of events. You're a professor. What do you find people, or particularly students, are most interested in? What lecture kind of grabs their attention the most? Well, it depends on the, it depends on the time. Uh, you know, I give a lot of different lectures, as you say, and it sort of sometimes depends on the client. Sometimes when I talk about science and politics in a political year, that's important. When there's a Star Trek movie out, <laughs> is when I talk about Star Trek. <laughs> On the whole, the most popular lecture appears that's been available to the public is certainly a lecture I gave called The Universe from Nothing. I think about 700,000 people have watched it on YouTube. Yep, I'm one of them. And, in fact, <laughs> yeah, and it's so important that I just finished on Sunday the, uh, book, the new book that I've just written, The Universe from Nothing. It'll come out a year from now based on that lecture. And I think it's a lot of fun. It expands on the stuff in the lecture and and I'm very pleased with it. I'll, and as I say, it's less than a day old in terms of being completed. Wow. Well, then we get to be the first ones. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> but uh, we'll be sure to put up a link to the video on YouTube. As you mentioned, it's a universe from nothing, and it's fantastic. I, I have to recommend it to everyone. Well, thanks. And then, and then, yeah, the link it up, and you can say the book's coming out next year. Definitely. We'll do that. Well, I know we've taken up enough of your time, but again, thank you so much. We are so appreciative to, to get to talk to you. No problem. And you can let me give me the link whenever you're thing, your podcast. Okay. Do. Thanks, Dr. Great. Krause. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that interview with uh, Dr. Krause. Um, if you did enjoy the interview, make sure you know speak your mind over at iTunes, Facebook, Twitter. Keep putting the show out there so we can keep growing this thing. It was fascinating to sit down and talk with them. Really encourage you to do a little research on your own or just through our website, smartpeoplepodcast.com, about Dr. Krause. He just wrote a book, Quantum Man, which is about the, the life of Richard Feynman. And he also will be releasing a book in a year, A Universe from Nothing. That book is coming from his YouTube video, the, the lecture that he did. And it's, it's up on our page. It's incredible. You will benefit from it. And that's what we're here to do is kind of just have everybody learn a little something, look at the, the world in different ways.